Hello everybody, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure for me to be here with uh, Professor Jeffrey Zai. Hi. Hello. It's uh, probably the most important well, student of uh, Milton Erickson and the founder and director of the Milton H. Erickson Foundation. And uh, he holds uh, an author with um, over than 20 books written and the architect of several important conferences like the Evolution of, Con uh, of Ther 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 Therapy Conference, the Brief Therapy Conference, Corporate Conference, and so on. And uh, today we are here to have a brief interview about psychotherapy, about hypnotherapy, and uh, other stuff. So, Professor Zaig, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. So, um, the next year will be the 40th anniversary since Milton Erickson's death. And so, um, what is different today? For who want to study and practice the Ericksonian therapy, what we gain in these years, in these decades, and uh, what we probably lost? Yes, uh, I'm sure that we lost a lot, and that's harder to define. Milton Erickson was primarily a conceptual communicator. He didn't con communicate facts, he didn't communicate didactic information. He communicated concepts. Now, think about that for a moment. If you want to communicate a concept, could be motivation, happiness, responsibility, connection, you can't use the same methodology that you would use to communicate a fact. The world of science, the world of mathematics is designed to communicate facts and we want to be accurate and we want to have as little ambiguity as possible when we're communicating facts. In physics, force equals mass times acceleration. That's a formula, it's an equation, it's a fact. The fact of the matter is that if you sum all of the numbers, one, two, three, four, five, unto a hundred, you will always get 5,050. That's a fact, it's unambiguous. But when we want to communicate a concept, that is not done in the same way. There's a different grammar. And primarily, the grammar of communicating concepts is located in the world of art. Artists do not communicate facts. Artists communicate concepts. So if you wanted to uh, feel something about the human structure and you looked at a sculpture from Modigliani, or if you looked at a sculpture from uh, Michelangelo, you, you would feel something that was conceptual, but you would not be trying to understand something factual. Now, hypnosis is conceptual communication. If you're using a hypnotic induction, you're communicating to the client, you can change your state. And out of all of the incredible experts that I have been blessed to meet, Carl Whitaker, Salvador Mnuchin, Virginia Satir, Watzlawick, um, uh, uh, Tim Beck, and Albert Ellis, Milton Erickson was the most interesting therapist in that he consistently communicated concepts. I was Erickson's student for six and a half years intermittently for the first years and then I moved to Phoenix to be closer to him and out of all of the time I spent individually and in groups with Milton Erickson he never I think that's a slight exaggeration he never explained facts he never explained to me how to do a hypnotic induction he never explained to me how to uh, do uh, the confusion technique the interspersal technique things that he was famous for Erickson communicated concepts, and one of those concepts was that I could be a better Jeff Zeig, I could be more experiential in my approach. Uh, just to give you an example, when I visited Erickson, I stayed at his guest house. To say that he had a guest house sounds like he had a palace. It was really a very modest place that he lived in. I was putting away my things and in the closet were old audio tapes of Milton Erickson doing lectures in the 1950s and 60s and 
I asked him, could I please listen to them and put them on cassette, a more modern form, so that they would be preserved for history? And he said, of course. And the people who went to the lectures in the 50s and 60s were not psychologists because there weren't so many psychologists. They were mostly physicians, dentists, different practitioners, obstetricians, gynecologists. And Erickson started the lecture, I will, um, uh, you know, uh, exaggerate, but hypnosis. Hypnosis is something that is realized. And you can realize hypnosis because hypnosis can be realized in so many ways now. And the realization of hypnosis can help you to take ideas and bring those ideas alive and make those ideas vibrant so that they can be recognized and realized. And I'm listening to this lecture and I start to get... Uh, a little uh, off balance, and I, Dr. Erickson, I ask him, this lecture sounded like one long hypnotic induction. And he said, oh, Jeff, I, I never listened to those old lectures. I, I, I didn't teach content. I taught to motivate. Now that is, a, a, that still to this day, it gives me a chill to think about that that out of all of the years that it took me to get my doctoral degree, where I had to memorize theories, research, facts, uh, techniques, and here was somebody who was teaching conceptually. So when Erickson was doing hypnosis, it was conceptual. When he was doing therapy, it was conceptual. When he was visiting with his family, it was conceptual. He was a remarkably conceptual uh, person interpersonally. In uh, his writing, he was very clear. He was very linear and he wrote beautifully. And if you want to learn what Erickson thought, read his papers and you will understand what Erickson thought. But when it came to being with people, he used hypnosis, metaphors, games, uh, symbolic assignments, directives. And these were all meant to help to elicit conceptual realizations that would alter people's state that will help people to change their identity. Okay. So that is a summary of my evolved understanding of Erickson. When I was visiting him in the 1970s, I couldn't have articulated that, but it's only as I've studied Erickson over these almost 40 years that I've been able to articulate what is essential about Erickson. Giving people experiences that will evoke conceptual realizations. Fantastic. Wow, uh, just listening to, to you to this explanation is, wow, okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> th there is a thing. Um, I'm writing a book on it right now, I'm just finishing a book. Okay, oh, about that? about uh, evocative communication. Evocative communication. Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it's very Italian. It's very Italian. Because uh, yeah. in, in, in Italy, there are more uh, signifying gestures than in any other culture. Yeah, it's true. It's, it's true. So. It's true. Um, well, in a recent article, you say that to elicit change, it's a matter of the therapist determining the minimal strategic step the client is willing to take. I really love that. Uh, in brief therapy, it's very usual and very Ericksonian saying, um, bring the client to do something different, to do something right. different. Right, right, right. The question is how to determine that something, that minimal strategic step. I think that Erickson say, um, observe, observe, observe. But the question for many psychologists, many psychotherapists is, Yes, but observe what? Yeah, um, those are two questions that I would think about separately. So let's take the first one. Yeah. In medicine, we treat the condition. So if the person has depression, that is seen as a condition. And then you give a medicine to treat depression. If the person has anxiety, you give a different medicine if they have a, uh, um, a, a uh, bipolar disorder, 
you give them a different medicine. So uh, in in medicine, it's very important to have a category. Mm-hmm. My what I say to my students in a social intervention: don't don't treat categories. Don't treat depression. You don't have a tool to do that. You're not a physician. You're a therapist. If you're going to do a social intervention, you need to, to look at the component structure. Yeah. Depression is a title that we give to a series of systemic components. Yeah. And those systemic components could be cognitive, behavioral, affective, perceptual, gestural, temporal, linguistic, historical, um, in terms of internal imagery, in terms of relationship patterns. And if you think about all of the different ways of communicating, uh, all of the different components of the human experience, then you can easily divide depression into its component parts. Now, for some people, just being internally absorbed is depressing. For some people, uh, uh, living in an unchangeable past, being locked into the unchangeable past, that's depressing. For other people, being disengaged from others is depressing. So we don't know what any particular person needs in terms of the number of systemic components that will lead that person to say, I'm depressed. So an easy way to do that is to ask the patient to teach the therapist how to be depressed. You know, tell me what to do. I'd like to know because sometimes I have patients who don't know how to be depressed. And although you might not believe it, that's really a terrible problem because depression, some degree of depression is normal. It's like deep rest. And we need that. We need a working depression when we are confronted with some of the challenges of life. So please teach me. Teach me how to be depressed. And what do you do cognitively? What do you do behaviorally? And sometimes with a patient, I'm just listening to the patient, and uh, I try to make a chart in my mind or sometimes on paper of what are the components and what are the primary components. Now, if you know the primary components, like somebody's depression is uh, a continuous negative dialogue, Mm -hmm. this nothing is going to change, this is going to be horrible, I can't do anything about it. If we know that the client is doing that, probably I wouldn't intervene in that area. I would choose something more peripheral, like could you make a change in the way in which the person perceives the world, that the person notices the colors that are apparent outside in a more vibrant way. So taking a small step is to find a peripheral component of the systemic Uh, aspect of the problem and work from the periphery in. It's the way that a doctor would palpate an appendix. If the doctor was palpating, they'd start from the outside and work their way in. And don't go to the area where there's the most entrenched resistance, but make a change in a peripheral area. Now, goals in psychotherapy are not like goals in medicine. In medicine, if a patient has a bacterial infection and goes to 10 different doctors, 10 different doctors are going to say you have a bacterial infection, you need an antibiotic. But if a person with depression goes to 10 different therapists, one is going to say you need to change your cognitions, the other is going to say you need to change your relationship patterns, you need to change your understanding of history, you need to change your posture. You need to change your diet. So uh, every therapist is going to come at the problem from a different road. And that's okay. So because uh, uh, therapy can be a very idiosyncratic enterprise, and what I would do with a depressed patient, Flavio, would be very different from what you would do, Flavio. And we could both be very successful coming at something from different angles because there's not one way of treating depression or anxiety or bad relationship. As in medicine, there is a much more algorithmic, formulaic way of treating problems. 
So we need to understand that being integrative, I don't even call myself an Ericksonian therapist, I call myself an integrative experiential psychotherapist, because to me, whatever works. And if I need to make transference interpretations or help people to change their negative cognitions or have people speaking to an empty chair, I I do whatever works. I'm not um, religious about my um, theory. I am a little bit more religious about my practice because as I develop as a therapist, I'm increasingly evocative, increasingly experiential. Goals basically are a, um, um, a, a um, interaction between the position of the therapist and the orientation of the client. So sometimes the client knows the exact goal, sometimes the therapist has a better understanding, but goals are negotiable. There's not one right goal for any particular problem in psychotherapy. So you try a goal, and if that doesn't work, feel free to change the goal. Um, You know, if you say to somebody that your depression is anger turned inward, and they don't change, and you say, okay, well, your, your depression is disturbed cognitions, or your depression is existential anxiety, if you, you can define a problem in many different ways, individually, in terms of two people, in terms of a family, in terms of the way in which the family interacts with an institution, in terms of the way the institution acts, interacts with the culture. There's no one right way to define a psychological problem. You can call it trauma or not, and uh, every therapist has uh, a... Um, a style and that style needs to be honored and developed and uh, every therapist will have ways that are different of working with depression or anxiety. It's not medicine, it's a social intervention.